lovely Lisa McKenzie, uh, who's going to be one of the keynote speakers at the Working Class Conference this year. So, um, firstly, uh, can, can you tell tell us a bit about yourself, your work, and where where you're coming from, and your drives? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm. I just can I just say I'm really proud to be part of this. Um, I've been waiting for 20 years to be part of something that was called working class academics. So, you know, to be a keynote speaker um, at the conference, I'm really, I've got to say, I just, I am really proud of that. It is something that I'm really proud. Of. And thank you for, you know, for sort of trusting me with this. So I just wanted to say that. Um, the reason I call myself a working class academic and I have done pretty much since getting my PhD really uh, is because it's such a politically charged thing to say and it shouldn't be but it is so when you say something like you know working class in together with an academic it causes so much friction because apparently academics if you do come from a working class background once you're an academic you can no longer be working class and apparently it's impossible for working class people to becoming academics in the first place. So, you know, I think using that term working class academic, it, it, it really jars with people and that's why we should keep saying it. And the reason I do call myself a working class academic is because, uh, you know, I grew up on a council estate. Um, my come from a mining community. Um, I didn't go to university as an 18 year old um, and sort of got involved in that university culture and had university friends. I went when I was 31. Um, I was already a mum. My son was 11, actually. Um, and I went to the university in Nottingham really as the only person with a local Nottingham accent, apart from cleaners and people who worked in the canteen. Um, I've always stayed and lived with, you know, working class people and working class communities. And that's who I, that's how I see myself um, still today, as I ever did, really. I, I'm, uh, one, one of the, the, the many things you've published, uh, I, I'm, I, I know of your book, for the sake of people watching, uh, can you say a little bit about, about your book, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose what I can do is just sort of say, because I know that a lot of us who are going to be attending this conference or are going to be part of this conference or watching this, you know, well, I know all of us are coming from working class backgrounds and our stories in how we get somewhere is really important to us. Um, and, he, and, and it's almost something that in academia or in college systems, it's the thing that you're supposed to leave at the door. It, you know, they call it baggage, actually. They call our working class backgrounds baggage. You know, leave your baggage at the door. And I think for me, it's about bringing it in because it's not baggage. You know, my family, my community, people that I love are not baggage. You know, they are actually who I am. So, you know, the insulting thing about leaving your working class baggage at the door, I always find that distasteful because it's almost like, you know, leave your dirty washing. There's nobody in my past or from my community that is dirty washing. Nobody. The opposite. So it's always important, I think, to talk about where you come from and how you got to where you did, because otherwise you take the politics out of it. You know, if we all sort of appear as fully functioning middle class academics, all that politics, all those class politics are stripped away from it. So, like I said, when I was 31, uh, I, like a lot of us from working class backgrounds, you know, something major happened in our lives and it sort of started to change the way that we thought. You know, from being 16, I worked in a, a factory. I used to make tights for Pretty Polly, actually. Um, those factories have all been closed now, so if I wanted to, I can't go back. And when I was 31, my mum died. Um, 
and it really shook me up and I started to think you know about my life and what I wanted to do and you know was I worthy of anything and I'd always you know my community that I'd lived in which was St Anne's in Nottingham a council estate um you know I'd always been part of something you know I'd always been doing something in the community and I thought I wonder if I could get a job doing something in the community because I'd love to give you know this giving back and especially for working class women it's what we want to do we want we want to be part of our communities and get paid for it imagine that getting paid so I thought well what could I do perhaps I could be a social worker and again it's a route that a lot of working class people go down that that sort of vocational route because to be an academic that just thinks and reads that's risky because when we get a job you know, are we good enough? Would we be invited in? So we go, I know, well, perhaps we could be a youth worker or we could be a social worker. So I went on an access course. Um, I was 30 years old. Uh, when I got on the access course, I read this book, which I may have it on my shelf somewhere. Well, I probably have, but I don't know where it is. Uh, oh, here it is. Action. So I came when I was at um, Baseford Hall College in Nottingham, I came across this book. It's called Poverty, the Forgotten Englishman, but, and it's by Ken Coates and Bill Silburn. And it is written about St. Anne's, the community that I lived in. So imagine finding a book that academics had written about where I lived. Um, and then the University of Nottingham sent somebody along to the access course. And I know that this doesn't really happen anymore. Um, to talk to us access students about going to university and this person came along and he mentioned this book and he said you know at the University of Nottingham we did this study um, about St Anne's and you know it's a sociological study and from then that's what I decided I wanted to do I wanted to talk about my community and I wanted to write about my community and because I didn't know you could do that at university and that's the honest truth I really didn't know that you could do that so instead of being a social worker or going down the social work route I went into sociology um, and almost from day one I decided that what I wanted to do is retell the story of St Anne's in Nottingham um, even though that's a fantastic book and it is it really is a fantastic book and I recommend it to anybody um, and there's also a film a, I think it was a panorama film that they made in the 1960s about St Andy Nottingham it's basically about poverty and housing um, and even though it's a great book and a great film it wasn't being told by a working class woman that lived there and so I kind of decided I'm going to do this. And so I did my undergraduate degree and almost 10 years from starting that undergraduate degree, I handed in my PhD, which was a piece of research about St. Anne's. And then my book, Getting By, came out of that. So it was almost, it's, it, so Getting By, um, it's a book, about working class life in Britain. I wrote it in 2010, 2012. The research was done before that. Um, and it's about just living on a council estate and all the good things about living on a council estate, because there are many, but then, you know, also the challenges as well. Um, and when I wrote it, you know, I didn't really think much about it. I just thought, oh, you know, I'll write a book. The only thing I did want, and I remember talking to the publisher about this, uh, because, again, for those of you that might not know, academic publishing is really expensive. And sometimes they take somebody's PhD, they turn it into a book, and then the book costs about 90 quid. And the one thing that I said to the publisher, and they were brilliant, Policy Press, is this book has got to be affordable. It's got to be cheap. It's got, you know, I've, it, people have got to be able to pay 10 quid and be able to have it. And that was my only, that was the thing that I really wanted because I wanted working class people to read it. Um, and the interesting thing about that is because I'd made that, that demand, 
it's now called a trade book. So it's not even an academic book, believe it or not, it's a trade book. And I just think it's really interesting, the amount of civin process that working class academics, working class voices, working class stories have to go through. So my book, Getting By, which is based on the PhD that I did, it's not even an academic book, it's a trade book. Um, and that's because I demanded that it would be affordable so working class people could read it. I also took out a lot of the academic language as well. Um, so I'm really proud of that book. I'm proud of it for lots of reasons, but mostly I'm proud of it because working class people have read that book. Really amazing to, to hear that origin of uh, poverty, the forgotten Englishman, and, and you you're taking it into a new a new life cycle. Um, so important. It's really important, Alex, that for working class, and I really hold on to this, is you cannot remove the context of who we are. And I know there are um, there are many people that would like to remove our context, but you can't because it's the context, the history, the politics, the family, the connections, the you know the policy decisions. It's all part of who we are and how we are. So you can't remove it. Um, and that's why I would say to anybody actually, read the old community studies because it really is the only place pre perhaps 1980s where we're written about. And we are written about, you know, it's not, mostly it's not us writing about ourselves, but it does give us the overall context you know, that this is not something that happened to this one family this week. It's not an, you know, being working class is not an individual experience. It's a political, ex it's a political wider experience about policy and politics and history. And so for me, you know, never look at the, the you know, the thing that's written this week, you know, look at that thing, but look at it in context with, you know, 200 years of working class history, which, you know, is on this, you know, in the, in, in, on this land and in other lands as well. Working class history is in the UK, but British working class history is in the UK. It's also in India. It's also in Pakistan. It's also in West, in the West Indies. Um, and you can't, take us out of that context. And I get really upset that people try and do that with us. You know, they try and talk about the last 10 years of austerity and somehow that explains our working class experience when actually it doesn't. You know, it just explains the last 10 years of policy and politics. And so I always say, you know, read the old stuff. Don't take it in as gospel like we do with every, you know, read it and be critical of it, but we are in there, we, you know, we are there. E.P. Thompson, you know, I'm a big fan of E.P. Thompson's book, The Making Of. And although, yes, he leaves out a lot of people and a lot of stories, but that making process is, understand, is, is important to understand working class, politics, life. Thank goodness there, there, there's this uh, interest and desire to, bring voices to the silences that have been stretched over, let's say, the majority of the world, to be honest. Uh, I'm, you know, thinking about the, the opening to um, Jonathan Rose's uh, The Intellectual Lives of the Working Classes, and he points out that the study, the, the historical study is really, really hard. It's almost impossible, you know, because the working classes were not published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things I think we should also celebrate. And it's so difficult to do this in an academic sphere because we should celebrate and, and talk about the way that our stories do come out. You know, family stories, photograph albums. Yes. Tell me any working class family that doesn't understand who they are 
through the stories that are told to them all of their lives. You know, when you are small children, you're told, you know, this is how we got here. And yes, a lot of the stories, you know, the stories are usually about struggle, perhaps defeating struggle, perhaps being, you know, it's that, it's that story, you know, we do valorize sometimes our stories. But actually, you know, if we don't, who else does? And so I think, you know, we need, particularly in anything that's called working class academics, or if we are working class people, we need to say first and foremost, that the way that we have been studied, the way that we have been written about, is not good enough for us. And I think for me, that's probably the base of who I am and what I do. You know, I am challenging everything that has happened to us, how we have been researched, how we've written about, how we continue to be shown and represented. We, you know, we're not doing it in our own voices, in our own ways. I remember a meeting when I worked at the LSE, a group of people from Australia, there are Aboriginal people, and they are actually fighting the government through thousands of years of storytelling because they have nothing written down to prove that that's their land and that is where they come from and they would and when I was talking to them about being working class being you know part of the British empire working class they said we have, we've got the same struggles and it really was important to me to think you know that our struggles and our storytelling are dangerous <laughs> And that's probably the reasons why we, we are silenced. This is indigenous, indigenous knowledge uh, and, and must be valued for that. I mean, uh, one of the ways that uh, knowledge has been transmitted is through what we sing and the folk tales. Absolutely. Absolutely. Music storytelling, art, um, to ignore this about us is actually to strip us away. It's to strip that politics of class away from us. It's to, it's to strip the, the class, you know, it's just, I suppose the unintended concept, or the, no, actually they're not unintended, the, the intended consequences of stripping away people's dignity um you know and when you know and I think you know one of the theorists that I like to read is Bourdieu and I think when he talks about culture and the way that some culture is valued and others isn't you know that is a process that again these are processes that happen to us they're not accidents it's not an accident that the stuff that we like is shit and the stuff that the middle class like is like really clever and good and you know it's not an accident it's a process um and i think we've got to always keep coming back to this process that the the you know we we these are processes that are, happen to us have happened to us and continue to happen to us they've not gone away you're making me think a lot about language and how we're told how to communicate what we're allowed to communicate the and and that the 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 dialects but well, interestingly no, accents <laughs> accent, sorry uh the the uh, i was talking to antonia darden uh about this as well and to, to illustrate the the point that's really burned into my mind is uh, I, I went, I was asked to present a conference, it was all about inequalities in a historical perspective. I went in and I delivered what I felt was a good presentation. Uh, and there was a, an academic who put their hand up and said, do you think you should be using this language? <laughs> I said, what do you mean by that? Well, social capital, the, you know, the, sociological terms when you're not a sociologist. I said, well, no, no, you've made the mistake of thinking that language is yours. Mm. 
and that people don't have this independent intellectual life. You know, I was talking to a guy on Leith Walk about Derrida. <laughs> you know, I was just like, my head was being blown by this guy. There is, there is, um, I don't know if you've come across, well, you probably have come across the book by Simon Charlesworth. Um, the phenomenology uh, of the working class. So oh, yeah. Simon Charlesworth, uh, he did his PhD, he's from Rotherham, did his PhD at Cambridge University. And he wrote about the way that he was talking to working class people in Rotherham about Bourdieu. And everybody got it. When he was saying, when he was talking to them about culture and the way things are valued and devalued, everybody understood it and everybody got it. Um, and it's a great book. And the sad thing about Simon Charlesworth is he never got an academic job, even though he'd written this fantastic book, you know, another working class casualty of academic, of academia, really. Mm. Um, you know, he was, they thought his writing was angry. <laughs> True. Oh, you know, that, that, that impossible double bind. You know, when you speak up, you're angry. When mm. you be silent, well, you've got nothing to say. Yeah. So, you know, so I think there's, there is, there are, there is, there's lots of words out there about us. And some of them we, written, we wrote them ourselves. And I think that's why this, this conference and this group of people are really important because we can start to make our own terms now. Um, and I would really encourage anybody that's coming to the conference or getting involved in the conference to do it in your own terms. There is nothing wrong with your accent. If you want to say Bourdieu uh, and you say his name wrong because you don't understand French, it it's fine if you want to say it perfectly that's fine um sing draw pictures you know we need to set these terms because these are our terms it's the only way it is the only way we can ever really challenge those structures and that process because you know as audra lord said you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools and I absolutely believe that, you know, um, and I see that a lot of the tools that are used around us are used purposefully to, to sort of to keep us in that process. Yeah, yeah. Um, so talking about the conference, um, I, so you're, we're going to get the pleasure of you doing a keynote. Uh, are you going to reveal to us a little bit about uh, what, what you might be bringing? Oh, yeah, I'm going to be bringing loads of anger, <laughs> <laughs> loads of, like, plague and pestilence on the wrongdoers. Yeah, I'm going to do Of course I'm going to do that, you know. And also what I want to do as well is I want to talk to us all about these ideas, about what we do, what, you know, and how we do it. So... You know, you, at a standard academic conferences, you give your paper, you say what research you've just done, what, what were your findings, what you are. That's not what I think we're interested in. We're not interested in another paper about us that we all know. You know, I'm interested in how do we, I mean, I, I got asked, so the Times Higher, uh, emailed me the other day about these working class lockdown diaries that I'm doing um, and they said to me it appears that you've done you know you've done this you've done rigorous research with these diaries and I have because I've collected working class people's diaries of the first 28 days of lockdown and I've cared for them and I've looked after them and I've treated them as I you know with respect um, and the Times Higher said to me, do you think they will be valued by academics? Because they're going to be, these are working class people's stories mm -hmm. about lockdown. And rather than them being a flat book, I've got some illustrators to illustrate these stories. So I'm going to make sure these stories come alive. 
because that's what I think we want to say with our stories. Um, and they said to me, but do you think that because it's a graphic novel and because there's lots of graphics in it, do you think it's going to be taken seriously in academia? And I suppose that's the question I'm going to be throwing out to all of us is, do we think that our ways of telling our stories and being in control of our narratives, you know, are they valued? And if they're not, why not? And then what do we do about that? Because should we always change everything about us and jump through those hoops? You know, is that is that how we've always got to be? Because I am I've had enough of it. Yeah, yeah, as well. As, <laughs> uh, 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 some kind of metamorphosis Kafka would write about. <laughs> yes. If you say so. I mean, I'm not, you know, I've got Kafka on my shelf. I've not read it. Although people at the moment keep saying to me, you've got to read Kafka. It's explain, going to explain loads of stuff. But yeah, I think I think it's time, you know, to talk about the processes, you know, what what we do, how we tell our stories, how we take our own power back. You know, there's a lot of people out there that's made a lot of money and made big careers out of our lives. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's time for us to really start to question that and to shine some spotlights on that as well. I'm, I'm interested to ask you a question, uh, and this is a question I ask uh, in multiple contexts to multiple people, right? Um, so when you look at, so in this situation, work, working class and what is being written about working classes in newspapers, in media. Mm. What do you think of those rep representations? Do you think, yeah, that, that, that's what it's like on St. Anne's? Or, yeah, what, 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 what are your thoughts? Do you think the media is representative? I mean, that's really complicated, isn't it? Because I, I remember being, because again, Oh, this is where all the multiple levels comes in. So I remember going to this. I tell stories. Look, I tell. I say, I'm gonna. I'm always. Every every answer is gonna be a story. I'm sorry. It's what I do. It's what we all do. Let's be honest. Um, so I remember going to this conference once in Manchester, uh, and it was an academic conference. It was really funny, actually. It was an academic conference about how terrible um, poverty porn is. So it was about Benefit Street, that sort of thing. And the conference was in, uh, in a community hall in a part of Manchester that had, they'd, they'd been a programme there called People Like Us. I don't know if anybody had seen it, but it was, it was sort of pre-Benefit uh, Street. So it was a like fly on the wall documentary about working class people that was living on this estate in Manchester. Um, and I remember there was a, you know, and, it, and so the academics thought they were doing this great thing by having it in, in a community centre and then asking community members to, to come. And but on the panels was all academics or middle class community workers or whatever. And so what they were doing is they were all sort of saying how terrible this poverty porn was, how terrible, you know, that working class, you know, how the way that we're represented on screen, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously all the academics agreed with all that, um, said that it was exploitative, rah -de -rah -de -rah. And then some of the community members put their hand up and said, I was in that program and I really loved it and I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed seeing it us on the telly. And I, and I'll tell you what, the academic didn't know what to do because there was actually people from that community saying, listen, it's all right for you to say you didn't like the way we were represented. And sometimes we don't like the way we're represented, but at least we're on the bloody telly. At least we were there. And actually some of that stuff we recognize that is, and I remember the same with Benefit Street, talking to people on, the, on my estate about Benefit Street, working class people liked it. And that is a really flip sort of complex thing. 
because we're, you know, that Channel 4 was definitely exploiting those people, definitely. But working class people did recognise some of their own stories there. And in a media and a political world and a cultural world where we are absolutely absent, when we do see each other, we do enjoy seeing each other. So I think it's a complicated, you know, it's not about, I think we are so absent, so absent. We're absent in politics, in the media, we're absent in, in all cultural industries. We're absent that when we even see a little bit of who we are, you know, we go, yeah, there we are, you know. Um, and then sometimes that's in Coronation Street. Sometimes it's in EastEnders, you know, sometimes it's on a panorama documentary. Sometimes it's on like, you know, killer cops or whatever, or, you know, gangsters in, on the street. But we do recognise when we see each other. And I think we're just so absent, so absent, that it's difficult now for us to, to even think about how we would be present. Yeah, yeah. And that's the stuff that I want to talk about at the conference is how do how do we become present? Because we don't know. I mean, you know, unless we, we you know, we, should we make a documentary where we exploit ourselves and tell people how poor we are and oh look at all the terrible drug dealers on our estate? Because that's the only way that we have become we can become present. But at the same time. There are some truths to that and if we were telling those truths ourselves they wouldn't look like that they would look some they would look different so i think that's the big that's the big question for me actually in my life at the moment well i'll tell you what i'll get get a printing press <laughs> we can get start cutting the cloth our, our own clothes huh? Well, don't, well, I mean, I absolutely, you know, sometimes new things aren't that new. Sometimes they're old things. Um, and telling our own stories and using, can we use the, the, the tools and the methods that's there? And I'd say that we probably can't. You know, today is the day where people are going out to vote. Um, how many people on those ballot papers are, going to be connected to working class people um you know politics everything we we've become so absent yeah absolutely absolutely so so what what do you think about the conference i think it's brilliant i think it's i'm so happy that there is actually a group of people a conference a space because that's the other thing, we don't have any space. Like I said, you know, I've been to so many academic conferences and, you know, the working class academics are sort of two people sat on their own that don't speak to anybody. Um, you know, or the people giving the paper and, you know, nobody's sat in the room, you know, these, these two people sat in the room while the superstar academic is next door talking about us. So actually having space, where we're all up front and we go, look, nobody's hiding anything here. We're not, nobody's under any false pretenses here. We're here because we believe there is some sort of shared experience and shared politics, even if those politics are broad, but it's about something about class politics. And I think having a space, and at the moment it's an online space, but it will be a real space one day. It will be an actual space. And that is the day I can't wait. I can't wait to come into a conference for working class academics and we can just go, hey, oh, you're all right. Oh, shall we get to the pub tonight? You know, and nobody is going to go through the bill and go, eh, excuse me, I didn't have the asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> because I have been on so many academic conferences where you have to go for these meals out and the middle class are sat there sort of drawing on the on the bill going eh, I didn't have the the sparkling water I had the tap water you know I'm just looking forward to 
those real spaces. But at the moment, I'm quite happy to have any space. Um, and that's how I feel about this conference and this group of people and all the delegates and everybody that's going to come because I was here last year at the last conference. And I know the difference was unbelievable. It's like a relief. And mm -hmm. I know this year and I know this year, you know, it's probably getting a bit more attention. It's bigger, but that's good. That's good because working class people, students, community members, anybody that wants to come, because as you've said, Alex, and you always say this, some of us are autodidacts. <laughs> some of us don't go to university, but my, my, one of my best mates, he's 70, nearly 70. That man still reads five books a week. Uh, yeah. And not, you know, and he reads books on the history of, um, you know, of class struggle in, you know, in different places all over the world. This man, you know, I sit and listen to him. He talks to me, he's a mentor. And he's not been to university, he's 70 years old. Um, but he's reads, he, you know, he goes around the charity shops, he's looking for books. Um, and he is still reading and still finding out about the class struggle. One of the things he's always said to me, his name is Martin, I call him the Whitechapel anarchist because uh, that's what he is. He lives in Whitechapel in London and he's an anarchist. But he always says to me that one of the most important things for us as working class people is to have some space to talk. And that is what this conference is about. It's giving us some space. You know, we, it, we haven't got to be ashamed about that space. We haven't got to sort of steal it. We've, it's there, it's there and it's for us and it's, and it's ours. And for all our rambling stories and our art and our songs, sad songs, and you know, it's who we are. And it's this is how we will build. This is this is how we will become present. And so I'm bigging this up, but I it's important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hear you. Why why, why should they come along uh, to the, the the conference this year? Why should you come along? Do you know what? Come, meet people, get, you know, hear each other's stories, tell your story, feel that there is a space for you. And there is nothing that you can say that anybody's, you know, nobody is going to be pulling to pieces your theory. You know, you come into a supportive network um, and it doesn't matter whether you are, autodidact and you read the books you, you know you just sit at home and you watch documentaries and you know there's a lot of good documentaries actually on that critical thinkers are engaging with um or whether you're a professor you know working class people and i know a lot of i know some it's not a lot there's not a lot of it but i know some working class professors who have gone through their whole lives not talking about class and you know, they've sort of, I know some professors who have retired that are only just now engaging with the fact that they've had to hide their class. So it doesn't matter, you know, whether you are student, community member, professor, you know, I think the working, this, this conference is offering us a space. And in a world where space has been taken and been took from us, and all that's left is these processes that we're getting pushed through. You know, come and take the space up. Because you know what? If you don't, the other lot will. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be sure about that. If we don't take the space, the elbows will be coming in. Yeah, yeah. But there's loads happening this year at a conference. And I... Is there anything in particular that you're particularly looking forward to? What I looked, what I really enjoyed last year, and I'm looking forward to this year, is the sort of, the, I mean, last year, uh, people sort of showed little graphics and clips and, you know, that, so that's what I'm looking forward to, I'm, and songs and poetry. So I'm looking forward to coming and finding those panels that 
you know, are filled with these stories. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, Valerie Walkerdine as well, who, <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing I'm looking forward to. Valerie is like another mentor of mine. Without Valerie, and this might be, this is a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Without Valerie Walkerdine, there would be no me. And that is a fact because I read her work as an undergraduate and realised that there was somebody that I could be, you know, and I wanted to be Valerie Walker Dine when I grew up. <laughs> I still do. But so Valerie, you know, she has walked the walk. She's talked the talk. She's done it. She's still doing it. Um, and so, you know, to listen to to someone like Valerie, I'm really looking forward to that actually. Because she's always good for her money, get Valerie. <laughs> so I think, you know, people should come, take the space up, yeah. take the space up, engage with it, um, go away and think, right, what, what we're next, what next? Um, I'll be honest, I, I may never go to another academic conference again <laughs> because this conference shows us that there are other ways to do it yeah it's, it's really it's really innovative that way it's it's a different form from the vertical structures yeah. that highly commodified highly state status driven very much like a trade show yeah, you you imagine, you know, I, I mean, I know because I've been there. And we, I think, you know, a lot of people who've been to academic conferences, you know, you are just finished your PhD and you've got to go to this conference because they've told you that, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to get your work out and you're paying loads of, you know, 400 quid or something to the conference and you've got a round table, you know, you're allowed on a round table. Oh, it's just, you know what, it's just abusive. It's actually, I just find it abusive. And this conference will not do that to anybody. Nobody at this conference will do that to each other because we've all been in that position where that's happened to us. Um, and I, I'm, that in, in itself is worth coming, that in itself is just worth coming to. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been so attracted to this by the, the feeling yeah, yeah. And you know what? What will come out of this is at the moment we are all online, but we won't always be online. And I think that's the important thing for this year is to sort of, you know, it's the platform for us to say, and next year we're going to meet. <laughs> and next year, you know, those songs will be sung and we will be there and we can sing along and those that poetry will be told and we can you know we can hear and be in the same room and and i just think this that's what this year i'm looking forward to that as well is knowing that next year we you know that we will have a hopefully we will have a real space of you know we've made space i mean making any sort of space is a it's what we it's what it's a massive feat in itself. The fact that we have made space in all the noise, there's this little three days, two days, that there's a bit of space for us. I mean, that is massive. Yeah. Last year, it felt massive. This year, it's massive. And we've took, we've took those two days now. And we've got them. And I think that's what, for me, that's what's important about this is we've took those two days. We should hold those two days. Well, so many people have been interested when I've introduced them to the, the conference. So uh, I, I do a lot of work uh, with, with uh, people who are without a board. And I can't think of another conference that would say, yeah, let's see if, if there are people who are you know, street scholars who Absolutely, yeah. do a presentation will find space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we we know that again, it's about taking that space. You know, I'm an anarchist, so I believe I always believe in taking space. 
you know, if you've got, because what I, I accept, we've got no space, you know, at least I'm honest about where we are as working class people, you know, we've got no, <laughs> so the minute we take something, you know, we need to hold it, and I think this conference is, we've got something, and we've got something that we can build on, and we can bring people in, and we can, you know, we can encourage people, like you said, people that would never come to something like this. Um, and we can bring them in now and be kind to them, you know, and, and not do a vertical, you know, these are the these are the people up here and you're down there. Um, you know, we can do that now because we all know, every one of us knows what that feels like. And we've got that space now, we've took it, we've got the ideas, we've run with it and we need to keep it. It's really important that we do. Absolutely, uh, I'm, 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 I'm stoked. I'm stoked to talk to you. And uh, is there anything else that you, you think should be in this conversation? I suppose, you know, let's not get, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a really, I'm really good at sort of telling us how great we are and, you know, good, you know, that we are, that we are interesting, worthy people that should be allowed to tell our stories in our ways. I'm really good at doing that, but I never underestimate how difficult that is. And I suppose that's the flip side to it. It is really difficult to do it because there are so many, in order to be heard, there are so many things that we have to do temper us, change our accents a bit, perhaps not say these words, you know, cut it down, not talk about the past, not be political, or whatever it is. And it is so difficult for us to be heard actually at the moment. So I'm not saying that coming to the conference is going to solve everything. You know, we're not all going to, we won't be able to join some big collective and all self-publish and, you know, and we'll all be great because doing that stuff is really hard and doing it when you've got no money, no resources, no support and four jobs is really, really hard. But we can start and at least knowing what the problem is accepting what the problem is and then thinking through it it's a start so are we all gonna after the conference go off and join collectives and change everything not immediately but one day <laughs> <laughs> excellent oh yeah you know it is manner your, your, your energy and just enjoyment it's uh, a friend told me uh that uh, I was their ass and a. I said, "What? What does that mean, Will?" <laughs> he said, "Yeah, it's what the French call uprooted." Uh, oh. And you, you know, it... I'm not uprooted. I don't feel uprooted. I'm from Nottingham, and I don't know. Again, for everybody out there, another good book. I'm. I love uh, recommending books. Saturday night, Sunday morning, by Alan Silito. The people from Nottingham are belligerent bastards. <laughs> and we've got a saying that's in the book, don't let the bastards grind you down. And that's where my energy comes from. It's out of spite. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, and that's, it's that energy just to, to be, the, and the right to be. It's an inalienable right to be. Alex, I'm not ashamed of who I am. Ah, yeah. that, and that, I think, is core for me. I make mistakes. I say stupid things. I do mad stuff. I'm not, I'm, I ain't got the best vocabulary. Uh, you know, I still, I didn't, have, I didn't have a real education. I still don't write well, <laughs> you know. But I am not ashamed of who I am. and. I'm not ever going to be apologise for any of that stuff because none of that was my fault. And that, I think, is where I, this, this, where this comes from because it wasn't my fault. Leaving school without an education, not 
and it wasn't my fault you know and I will never apologize for that or for any any of us I will never apologize for us and you know this is who I am and I think that is kind of the essence of the way that our politics our our education must go in yeah. you know they, they make us apologize <laughs> they make us apologize for the shit education they provided for us you know i'm not doing it i get things wrong i sometimes don't say things right i don't know where full stops should go, come and go everything i write has to be edited to in an inch of its life because i'm not that great at writing but i'm not apologizing for it yeah well, so, someone said to me never apologize for pronouncing a, a word wrong or a name wrong because it tells me that you've read this independently you've you you know and that's that's something i'd like to see reclaimed understood that it's no you can't take that I'm not apologi- I don't think, and I think that's one of the good things about this conference is nobody's apologizing. I, I was on a lot of, I, you know, I was in a lot of the, the sessions last year and people got upset and they got emotional um, and people were t- talking about their backgrounds. Nobody should ever apologize for that. We have no space. So, you know, this is who we are. And rather than try and force us into this system that we don't fit we can't thrive in you know i'm not i'm not doing that anymore you know i've been i don't think i ever did like actually i don't think i ever did but i'm not doing it anyway and you know i would say to everybody who's coming to the conference you know this is not that's not the conference you come into where you're going to be forced into something you're not comfortable in where you'll be supported um and that's it really i've got no else to say you've talked me out <laughs> okay is there somewhere people can tune into your work on the internet oh i don't know probably i won't recommend it but <laughs> um do you know what? i'm just on the normal things you know like instagram facebook twitter uh you know, I write things for Russia Today sometimes. Apparently, I'm now a spy. Hooray! Uh, it makes me excited. Um, you know, I try and write. I try, even though I've got bad grammar. Obviously, I've got, even though I've got bad, I've got bad grammar. I write. I do write. Write, 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 write. Speak, 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 speak. Because, so I think it'd be hard to not find me if you wanted to. <laughs> Well, Lisa McKenzie, folks, go go out, use search engines, find find all the the, the the stuff Lisa has out there, and you may be able to hassle her on social media too. <laughs> so do it. Do it. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, thank you.